covered thus far have ranged from the impact of geopolitics on tourism, and most recently, tourism resilience and COVID-19. On February 17, 2023, the GTR CMC and our partners will launch our Tourism Resilience Day as our, at our global conference on tourism resilience for sustainable development in Kingston, Jamaica. Tourism resilience represents an important day for us, to both mark and remind us of the importance of tourism resilience for global sustainability. Today, however, we focus our efforts on resilience and disaster risk reduction for tourism sustainability, a topic that is very critical, especially now. While the global tourism industry has been traditionally recognized and described by many as resilient on account of its ability to demonstrate its capacity to bounce back quickly from shocks, as history has clearly indicated, increasingly we have come to realize that disruptive forces threaten the sustainability of global tourism worldwide. We have seen sporadic and a wide range of number of natural disasters that have significantly impacted climate change. These have ranged from floods that we're now seeing in many parts of the world, typhoons that many countries are experiencing, both Jamaica and, and Japan both experience, experienced a recent scare with the possibility of a typhoon. Fortunately, in both instances, countries were spared and thus lives were spared. But today we examine some of these issues. But before we begin the program, the official program that is, I would like to invite Ambassador, Jamaica's ambassador to Japan, Ambassador Richards, who has been a quarterback behind this particular event. She has actually, she and her team have both significantly contributed to us being able to host this event and as well as facilitating the GTR CMC in Japan. Um, ambassador, I'll be the first to say thank you for your hard work and it's been a pleasure working with you. Ambassador. Master and Risk Governance with the United Nations Development Programme, and Mr. Taro Morishima, General Manager of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan and other members of the club. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, again, ohaya gozaimasu, good morning, from here in Tokyo, Japan. I am delighted to warmly welcome all our participants, including our audience here at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, which is one of the world's oldest and most prestigious press club. I also warmly welcome our online participants in the Caribbean, Europe, and elsewhere in the world. Thank you all for joining us. Today's seminar is quite timely for three main reasons. First, it comes on the heels of the Tourism Expo Japan 2022, which over the past four days encourage us to restart as we take on the new challenges of a new era in tourism. For the second reason, the weather events of the past week in Japan and Jamaica are reminders of the continued impact of natural disasters, whether sudden or cyclical on our tourism industry. The third and final reason is that building resilience is an iterative process, one which requires us to constantly transform our experiences and lessons into concrete, adaptive measures. It is precisely for this reason that the GTR CMC was established at the University of the West Indies in 2018, and the embassy is therefore pleased to partner with the center to organize this seminar under the its Ed Bartlett lecture series. Ladies and gentlemen, in March 2015, the international community adopted the Sendai framework and with its adoption, 
we pledge to further integrate resilience and disaster risk reduction in all areas of global and national development. Fast forward to March 2020, where the world's resilience was put to a severe test after the novel coronavirus was declared a pandemic. Since that time, the world has experienced prolonged and unimagined disruptions to the system and supply chains to which we have been accustomed. While all aspects of social and economic life were impacted by the global pandemic, the tourism industry took a significant hit. Indeed, COVID-19 added itself to a list of challenges to the tourism industry, including the other C, climate change, and its attendant environmental impacts. In what was dubbed tourism's worst year in history, 2020 saw a 74% drop in international arrivals. Greater still was the impact of the pandemic on the Caribbean, a region that has been ranked globally as the most tourism dependent region with 34 to 48% of GDP coming from tourism. Within these statistics, we can recognize how much of an existential threat COVID-19 posed to our tourism ecosystem. Across the Caribbean, while we dealt with the public health side of the pandemic with relative success, our new economic realities affected our ability to respond to COVID-19's far-reaching impacts. Guided by scientific evidence and data-driven decision-making, Jamaica swiftly moved to reopen its borders in June 2020 to mitigate the negative economic and social effects of the pandemic. Thanks to strict protocols and measures that we have, de- that we have developed for all segments of the tourist industry, Jamaica has been able to recover with relative success. But while these have served us well in the short term, how can we achieve long-term recovery that effectively address our social, our economic, and environmental challenges? How do we ensure that future society can withstand disruptions like those brought on by COVID-19 or just about any other external shock that might, might present itself, be it economic, technological, or environmental? As we seek to put the worst of the pandemic behind us, sustainability, resilience, innovation, and digital transformation have emerged as key features of the discourse on recovery. While the Sendai framework calls on us to build back better, we must now not only build back better, but also stronger. Today, the Honorable Edmund Bartlett, Jamaica's Minister of Tourism, and a distinguished panel of experts will offer their perspectives on how we can leverage resilience building and disaster risk reduction to future-proof our tourism ecosystem. Minister Bartlett has been a strong global champion for global tourism resilience. And and the panel boasts thought leaders and practitioners in the fields of tourism and disaster risk management. Together, they will contribute to enriching action-oriented dialogue towards resilience in the sector. I thank you once again for joining us. And I look forward to fruitful discussions during today's seminar. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, in 2018, Jamaica hosted a global conference on tourism and jobs. Uh, one of the calls from that conference, from the stakeholders there, was the need for a center or a body or an entity to focus specifically on tourism resilience for sustainable development. Resilience in and of itself was emerging as an important concept in the development lexicon. And as a result of that, there needed to be a focus on tourism and tourism resilience. Uh, So, you know, Minister Bartlett um, had an idea of establishing a center. He met with the vice chancellor uh, for the University of West Indies, Sir Hilary Beckles, and that was in 2019. In 2022, today, I can report that we've established six centers, some of which are fully operational and others are moving in that particular direction. We have undertaken over 23 projects worldwide, uh, many of which have been just bringing persons together 
um, looking at the challenges that test nations face and solutions to, the cha- to, the, to those challenges and just bringing them together. We provide the technical assistance to 18 countries and have an influence policy worldwide through 15 high-level task force or, and committees. Um, that is just to say that the center, though established in 2019, in a very, very short period of time and during a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, was able to mushroom and easily respond to the challenges that emerged during COVID because uh, one of the thematic areas for the Global Tourism Resilience and Crisis Management Center in, in 2018 was actually dealing with pandemics. And Mr. Bartlett had the foresight to recognize that this would have been a possibly emerging challenge given the history of the tourism space and other epidemics that have emerged in the last decade. And and, and for that, I I can personally say we really thank the Minister for the foresight and the vision to establish such a creature that is well needed now in a space that, uh, which is a tourism space, which we've now recognized since COVID directly impacts on the development of countries both industrializing countries and industrial and industrialized countries. Uh, so, Minister Bartlett, um, on behalf of those of us who work for the center, thank you. We know that you're far away from the country in Japan, but um, we, we are looking forward to your remarks. So I think that was your introduction, sir. Thank you for that very unusual and special introduction. Uh, distinguished partners all across uh, the world who are tuned into this lecture series today. It is indeed, I think, a a momentous uh, period in our development as a human family as we are attempting to recover, to recover stronger, better, and more uh, resilient uh, from perhaps the most uh, existential threat that Anthropocene Earth has experienced. So whilst we recognize tourism over the years as being a very resilient uh, economic activity, its vulnerabilities are equally well known. And so today's lecture will seek to look beyond what we have known and to focus a little bit on what we need to know to ensure that this great industry continues to be the uh, driver of economic recovery globally, um, but in a more inclusive way, and one which enables the resilience to express itself fully in sustainability of a sector, and indeed a species in the end that is vital to the world. So while the global tourism industry, I think, has been traditionally described as resilient, on account of its demonstrable capacity to recover quickly from past shocks. The industry is equally vulnerable to cyclical shocks of various types. Increasingly, the disruptive forces threatening the sustainability of the global tourism industry have become more sporadic and wide ranging. They include natural disasters, climate change impacts, epidemics and pandemics, cyber crimes, political instability, terrorism, wars, and economic crises. Indeed, the ongoing pandemic over the past two years has tested the presumed resilience of the tourism industry more than any previous disruptive event in modern history. It has forced all destinations, irrespective of size, location, and attributes, into indefinite survival mode. It has presented challenges that national, regional, and global stakeholders have been unable to respond to with only degrees of confidence or certainty that have characterized them in the past. It has also heightened consciousness that the global tourism sector can no longer be taken off guard by disruptive events as it prepares for a future of more 
uncertainties. Instead, the whole industry is called upon to adopt a, methodolog a, methodolog a methodological, collaborative, and institutional approach towards resilience building. Indeed, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the attitude towards resilience building among stakeholders of tourism can no longer be discretionary. Resilience building has to become the most important catalyst of the survival and the competitiveness of the post-COVID-19 global travel and the tourism industry. Since the pandemic started, many destinations have unveiled a number of action-oriented measures to drive the recovery of the tourism sector. There has been a frantic exploration of innovation, synergies, and creativity to ensure that destinations remain open for business in a safe and healthy environment. There has been unprecedented attention paid to processes, standards, measurements, and responsible patterns of behavior by all involved in the value chain to ensure that the sector meets the demands for the delivery of a more sustainable tourism product. One indeed that balances economic, social, environmental, and human interests. Overall, therefore, as an unavoidable consequence of the pandemic, stakeholders have also been forced to contemplate more profoundly the current challenges and future needs of the tourism industry and how we can respond in a decisive manner. Years of accumulated wisdom have also indicated that travelers' perceptions of destination attractiveness and security can be easily impacted by even minor disruptive events, let alone major ones. Climate change in particular and its consequences, such as extreme climatic conditions, sea level rise, and biodiversity loss has been singled out as the most urgent threat to both marine-based and land-based tourism, with small island destinations such as those belonging to us in the Caribbean, and I speak as a Caribbean man at this moment, considered, of course, to be among the really specially vulnerable. Given, therefore, the context provided, Disaster risk management, I think, plays a crucial role in the sustainability of competitive tourism ecosystems. The process enables destination to address disaster risks that may develop in the future based on current and past experiences and the lessons learned. It measures the readiness of destinations to manage disaster risk along four key dimensions. One, hazard awareness. Two, exposure. And three, vulnerability and capacity. At the recent expo, I, at the round table, ministerial round table, made the call, a call which I think has resonance, for a fund to be established, a tourism global resilience fund in order to respond to some of these four points that I've just enumerated. I hope that that will take on some legs from this most resilient uh, country in the world, Japan, and resonates across the world with positive responses. Ultimately, taking account of these four elements of disaster risk management will enable destinations to better map and reduce disaster risk and ensure tourism sustainability. Thus, as an urgent requirement, major stakeholders of the global tourism industry must now give a higher level of prioritization to disaster risk management in the designing and implementation of their business models and long-term growth strategies. 
crisis or risk management, however, must be approached as a cycle or as a process with many complementary overlapping components, several stages and levels of input and progression. Different agencies, groups, and stakeholders must all be working collaboratively and symmetrically across sectors based on shared goals and objectives. And this constancy of monitoring and evaluation of systems, processes, and outcomes, and indeed reinventing and rethinking of strategies and approaches must then provide the basis for evolving considerations and capabilities. The importance of rethinking how we approach tourism is underscored, I think, by the United Nations World Tourism Organization's theme for World Tourism Day, which is being observed on September 27 under the theme Rethinking Tourism. According to the UNWTO, this means putting people and planet first and bringing everyone from government and businesses to the local communities. And the local communities are so important in this, um, all together around a shared vision for a more sustainable, inclusive, and resilient sector. This year's World Tourism Day theme will also guide Jamaica's activities for Tourism Awareness Week, which runs from September 25 to October 1, as we continue to raise awareness of the importance of tourism and its social, cultural, political, and economic value. With this in mind, as we rethink our approach to tourism within the context of resilience building, it must be underscored that a critical facet of crisis or risk management is being proactive, anticipating, planning, and innovating to prevent disruptive events from happening or being able to mitigate their impact when they happen instead of constantly being taken off guard. An effective crisis or risk management framework aims to build the capacity of destinations to anticipate and respond to threats through institution building, formulation of standards for vulnerability assessment and risk mapping, identifying best practices and adapting lessons learned from previous crises. Likewise, Providing safety nets to absorb risks through the establishment of various financial and insurance models, emphasizing and incentivizing corporate social responsibility as an ethos underpinning the tourism sector, harnessing and ensuring that the transformative capacities of technology are brought into play. Strengthening also the regulatory framework through public policy and the enforcement of policies and practices, as well as the harmonization and standardization of disaster preparedness and hazard management systems. All these are critical elements that have to be brought together. Additionally, investing in training and research to enhance knowledge and build human capital and strengthening planning collaboration, information sharing, and policy designs across multiple internal and external stakeholders. Within the ideal crisis management architecture, therefore, there will be important roles for different actors and organizations. The government will assume primary responsibility for regulating environmental, coastal, and hazard management health and safety standards, and to build codes and for buildings and ensure that the practices of the sector are compliant. Hoteliers, the other element of the partnership, will have to consciously and deliberately accelerate the shift to more sustainable and environmentally friendly patterns of production, energy generation, consumption, and construction that balances the importance of environmental sustainability with the economic benefits of tourism. In other words, we have to see 
sustainability and resilience as part of the balance sheet and the profit motive. Greater collaboration is needed, therefore, between tourism agencies, training institutions, and universities to develop the competencies, qualification, and knowledge, and to create that base that enables tourism labor force, which is very critical, especially in areas that will increasingly define the future of tourism. So that there has to be a re-architecture of the labor market system within our tourism space to enable a stronger and more effective contribution of the human capital to the development of the industries. The private sector, through financial institutions and insurance companies in particular, will, I think, assume a critical supportive role in terms of increasing access to capital and credit to finance the transitioning of hotels to sustainability, providing, I think, travel insurance coverage. This is one critical area. And parametric insurance schemes to protect visitors from travel-related risks and to provide first response financial re and uh, relief for destinations that are hit by natural disaster. I referenced that earlier by way of my comment about the Resilience Fund. The scientific and technological communities, I think, will be required to conduct pioneering and breakthrough research and develop innovations and technological solutions. Ultimately, therefore, as the global tourism sector looks to the future and rethinks tourism, the notion of a sustainable and resilient tourism sector warrants that the new look tourism industry harmonizes with the environment, promotes the safeguarding of cultural and natural heritage, protects livelihoods, benefit local communities, while responding to the changing expectations of sustainable behaviors and cultures by all tourism stakeholders. I think that this is a critical moment for us to consider a more global approach, and that indeed the call is timely, as was given by our own Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, in his address to the United Nations a few days ago, when he made the point that Jamaica proposes to have officially designated February 17 every year as a Global Tourism Resilience Day. In his own words, and I quote, this annual commemoration would serve to encourage a consistent examination of resilience building in the tourism industry in the face of persisting global disruptions to sustainable tourism and sustainable development, unquote. We have been engaging countries across the world in our efforts to boost the resilience in global tourism. And we encourage the global community to work with us towards commemorating the first Global Tourism Resilience Day in 2023. I invite you all to join us. Join the myriad of tourism institutions across the world that have already embraced the idea of a Global Tourism Resilience Day. And let us all meet in Jamaica on the 17th of February, 2023. May today's discussions not only please and satisfy the need for a building of rigor and the strengthening of the quality of discourses around the two most important pillars that predicates our future, resilience and sustainability. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Minister Bartlett, for your riveting and usually thought-provoking presentation. I would like to now invite Mr. Takamatsu, our first presenter, Mr. Tam Takamatsu, who is the president of Tourism Resilience Japan, is no stranger to disaster risk reduction and tourism. For example, Mr. Takamatsu played an important role in the launch of Japan Tourism Marketing 
poor and he has spent his, his whole life doing work on both crisis management, um, tourism, and risk reduction, disaster risk reduction, in which he has been focusing to ensure that the safety of the visitors and the business and that business continuity of travel and tourism is facilitated. He is currently a member of the UNWTO Tourism Barometer Panel of Tourism Experts, as well as the UN. DRR Arise, which is a private sector alliance for, to, for disaster risk societies. And he's also an, an, a member of the expert committee for the World City Tourism Federation. And he currently serves as a visiting professor at the University of Tokyo and International Tourism Management at, uni, at, to, at Tokyo University. Um, as you can see, he is quite 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 knowledgeable on this topic and he has focused a lot on it and the floor is yours sir well good morning and good evening uh, people in J jamaica and thank you very much uh, dr walla for such a such a fantastic uh, introduction of me a uh, little bit more than I, what i'm actually am. and uh, i really want to thank firstly uh, to Minister Bartlett and uh, Ambassador uh, Richards for inviting me to this um, great opportunity to speak about the tourism resilience and uh, crisis management. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, to start with, of course, the people are here uh, uh, quite aware of uh, what to, uh, resilience and crisis management are, but uh, thinking of the, the general uh, audience who may not be uh, so familiar with this concept, I start with the uh, uh, sharing the definition of resilience and crisis management. As you see in the slides, the resilience, according to Cambridge Business English Dictionary, it says the quality of being able to return quickly to a previous good condition after problems, which just uh, minister uh, repeatedly uh, pointed out. And also the, this center is a crisis management center as well. And crisis management, according to the same dictionary says, the actions that are taken to deal with emergency or a difficult situation in an organized way. So uh, when we th think about the resilience and crisis management, we have to look at both ways, the resilience and crisis management. Um, next slide, please. Why? Why do we have to think about and be prepared for the resilience and crisis management? One of the reasons of course, is the tourism is an economic gen uh, generator worldwide, and especially in the Caribbean island. And world, uh, even uh, globally, it, uh, the sector contributes to 10.4% uh, uh, of the global GDP in uh, uh, 2019, which was a uh, uh, pre-pandemic year. And it supports one out of 10 jobs in the world, uh, accounting for 330 million worldwide. And more than that, one out of ten, uh, five jobs were generated by tourism sector during the last five years. So it is the fastest go growing uh, industry sector. And on the other side, the minister, just as minister also pointed out, the tourism is so prone and vulnerable to crisis. And for this reason, safety of the destination is a priority in selecting uh, the holiday destinations for the tourist. That's one reason. And destinations and tourism businesses are responsible for ensuring safety of the visitors when there is the emergency takes place. 
And lastly, and finally, rapid post-disaster recovery significantly contributes to the recovery of the community as a whole, not only limited to the, what we call tourism sector, but also the entire society and community. So for these reasons, uh, uh, tourism, uh, tourism resilience is so important. And uh, here again, just the, uh, the minister pointed out, and there are so many different kinds of, uh, you know, disaster crisis risks that impact the tourism sector, including natural disaster risks and human-induced disaster risks and you know, health hazard risks. And in addition to that, when all these kind of the, the, the hazards takes place, there's always what we call perception and reputation cri uh, crisis risks. People tend to think that, oh, this destination is impacted by a disaster. So maybe uh, we can change the, uh, you know, uh, destination for the next holiday, or maybe we should uh, wait for another year or two to go to that destination, where even the, uh, the, the, this particular destination is back to normal at that time. That is called reputation uh, crisis or perception crisis. Next, please. So this is just a brief what uh, we have to do uh, in tourism crisis management in, in just one glance. And in the middle, there, there is a crisis incident. And there are things that we need to do before pre-incident phases, including reduction of the risks and readiness for a quick and appropriate response. And that is followed by the recovery of the destination after the, uh, the disaster. Next, please. And when you think about the, the resilience and crisis management, for the very first step is to identify risks and impact. Um, should you, if you fail to identify major risks, what we call unexpected, the unexpected takes place. And if there is something unexpected takes place, we are the last what to do. And maybe not be able to respond quickly and appropriately. Therefore, uh, the first thing in uh, tourism resilience and crisis management is identifying the risks and impacts induced by the crisis. And then once they are identified and analyzed, the next stage is proactively plan countermeasures and mitigation of the expected risks and impacts. Okay, we have the plan now. But even though the uh, you know comprehensive uh, risk management plan with 200 pages <laughs> in a booklet means nothing unless there is a preparing for proper uh, and appropriate response to the crisis risk and ensure visitor uh, to ensure uh, visitor safety and rapid recovery are impacted tourist visitors and destination. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the uh, very uh, uh, rough timeline of the crisis disaster, disaster in tourism, uh, starting with the uh, pre-incident phase all the way down to the recovery. So just as um, I have uh, discussed earlier, uh, there are a couple, uh, lo lots of things to be done before and Onset of the at the onset of the disaster and after the disaster until the recovery, and I divided this chart into two uh, vertical uh, lines, uh, which was uh, the what we need to do to ensure the safety of the visitors and relief of the, their concerns and anxiety on the left hand side, and on right hand side. 
business continuity, uh, continuity and recovery of the uh, tourism related businesses and also the destination communities. So, uh, especially for, for, from the uh, business, the tourism business uh, perspective, we have to look at both sides safety of the visitors, the confidence of the visitors. On the other hand, we need to go on our business, even if we experience the emergency. Next, please. So right here on the other, uh, pink, pink uh, shows the, the, what we do uh, for the visitor's safety. And on, on the right-hand side is the uh, business continuity. And when you look at the, the, the you know, uh, the circle, I mean, a square, on your left hand side for the visitor safety relief, it is very limited in time. It takes only for a few days after what the incident takes place. You have to really concentrate in uh, ensuring safety after maybe few few days few days after the incident, but and then then the visitors will not be there anymore. They will return home safely, and, and if they are, you know, return home safely. The activity for the visit safety is done, complete. Then, or there is a long mission of continuing your business and recovery of the destinations as well as your business operation. Next slide, please. And as I first said, uh, it's uh, critically important to identify the risks and impacts to the visitors, for example. Um, when we look, uh, take an example of earthquake, there are lots of uh, risks, in, you know, uh, takes place, uh, like uh, maybe, maybe the buildings collapse or something falls from the window, broken, you know, glasses, and then the impact to the visitors of injuries and, well, sometimes death. And uh, the earthquake takes place and there is a continuous aftershock and it it's really terrifies the concerns of the safety of the visitors. And when there is an earthquake, well, most of the times where there, there's a major earthquake, there's a, uh, the power failure no electricity and this has significant impact to the visitors there because we lose the lighting we lose air conditioning loss of the water supply when you think about it. even though there's this water supply in buildings in hotels they use electricity to pump up the water on to to, to the tank of the top of the building but this uh you know uh the uh, pump uh works on electricity power so if there is a loss of electricity no water that means no shower no toilet and elevator operation of course suspended and worst thing is when there is no power, we don't have power to charge these devices, meaning we're kind of shut down from the information without these devices nowadays. And um, another impact, a uh, major impact to the visitors are suspension of the transportation services. Take earthquakes, for example, the trains, buses, they, they stop operation. They suspend operation for quite a long period of time. And vis visitors cannot, you know, travel to other places, cannot return if they are, they are terrified in the, the, in the destination where the earthquake hits. And the, when, uh, in, the, in, the, in addition to that, there will be a restriction or making calls. 
because there are too many calls and mixes up the, the uh, telecommunication system and they just shut down all the outgoing calls. So there's a big, big uh, impact on the communication, meaning uh, uh, collecting, getting the information about the, the, the disaster or situation and also communicating to your families and, you know, the people uh, concerned to, that you are safe or whatever is happening. Next slide, please. And visitors, no matter what the, uh, the emergency is, these are general uh, concerns. So these are not uh, critical risks for their, their safety of the lives, but still, they're very much concerned and anxious about what's going to happen to me. Like, how, how, how can I ensure my safety? What do I have to do to be, stay safe? Or what about the safety of the, my, my family who are just out there? Or the vis how, how to travel home and onward? And I go to get information, enough information, especially in our own language. And lastly, uh, where can I get food and water? Next slide. Uh, next slide. So uh, in order to minimize those impacts or relieve the, the concerns, there are lots of things that the, uh, the tourism operators can do before and after the incident or onset of that. Uh, the, the disaster. For example, um, in case of maybe earthquakes just strike uh, uh, unexpectedly, but uh, think about the hurricanes. You know that hurricanes are, you know, approaching in a few, few days before. So during that time, you, you maybe you can uh, provide the uh, emergency alert to the, the uh, visitors there or those who are planning to come over. To uh, return home earlier than, than planned, or uh, maybe wait for wait until the, the hurricane is over, or um, you can also eliminate the the risk factors that may have the major impact to the, the visitors, like uh, taking out the the some of the things that may be uh, blown out from the, the wind gust by the hurricane so that they won't hit the, the visitors there. Or on, and at the onset of the disaster, of course, uh, you can uh, make a safety instruction to the visitors and clients there and lead them to uh, shelter for evacuation, something. And after the, the, the first shock of the uh, disaster, you can prov provide uh, situation, uh, information on the situation and evacuate, shel sh uh, provide shelter for the visitors. And you also need to support their communication, both getting the information and also, um, you know, outgoing communication like telephones. And finally, uh, when, when the situation is settled, you do want to assist the visitors go home. So these are the things that is, are really highly expected to the uh, businesses at the front uh, when they experience the, their major, uh, major disasters and crisis. And the impact to tourism business, this, these are mostly business continuity, risks for the business continuity. Um, maybe there is physical damages on the properties, buildings, whatever. Then they, they, they have to suspend their business operation. and. Maybe uh, when, when there is an, the information of the disaster taking place on one, one uh, destinations, there will be a uh, there will be a cancellation of the booking. 
just a huge number of the cancellation coming in. And after the, the, cl- the crisis, there will be sharp decline of the visitors that we have just uh, um, experienced over the last few years. And that will um, end up with the, the uh, significant decline of revenue and operational losses of the businesses. Next slide, please. Therefore, there are a lot of things that uh, business continue, uh, the business, uh, the tourism business can do to mitigate the impact of the, the crisis to their business operation. And especially, really have to think it, just as the, the, the minister mentioned, financing is the, the key to the business operation, you know. Even if there's no physical damage to their properties or whatever, there is a sharp decline of the, the uh, clients and revenue. That means you will be uh, out of the, the cash flow. So immediately uh, after the, the, the disaster event, the number one thing of the management of the, the tourism business have to do is securing working capital, money to continue running the operation. And also another very, very important thing is to secure the employment of your people. Because the tourism businesses are m- nearly 100% uh, dependent dependent on the works of the employees, the services they generate, they provide. So when uh, after the, the crisis, if the, the employees are, have the concern, well, am I going to, can, can I stay with this organization and this company and maybe I will lose jobs or something? And they, without those concerns, they are very likely to leave the jobs. And after the recovery, even the, the properties and facilities are back to normal. There's no, no one to serve the clients. So securing the employment is another very, very important factor for business continuity. Next slide, please. And in order to, um, you know, uh, ensure prompt and appropriate response immediately following a crisis event, we need crisis management plan with manuals and business continuity plan, we call BCP. And with that, we need to have education and training and drills to your organization, employees and staff. I, uh, a few years ago, I had a very good conversation with the, uh, the risk management manager of the Qantas. And what he t- told me was very impressive. We have many thousands of different uh, manuals and they, the, the, our crew just learn everything here in the brain. They read and understand what they have to do, but we're not satisfied with that. We train the crew until the muscles learn. That's the most impressive word I heard from the Qantas guy. And I think it's very true. And do you know that Qantas has been regarded as the, 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 uh, the safest airline in the world for the last more than 10 years. That's a secret behind this. They train until the crew until the muscles learn, not, not just the brain. And being ready involves more than making plans and running an occasional drill, says the pata, and readiness nips potential crisis in the butt. Next slide. And finally, the recovery. 
Um, Pata also says that returning to organization to normal uh, after crisis and have visitors returning to crisis affected destinations as quickly as possible. So post uh, crisis uh, recovery includes infrastructure, infrastructure supply chain like uh, line and transport it back to normal and tourism service operation back to normal. So these are hard, uh, hardware and also software of the operation back to normal and perception and reputation of the de affected destination. This is also very important as I said earlier. And visit traffic and tourism revenue. And next slide, please. And the key to the tourism recovery marketing is communicate to the market that the affected destination is back to normal and safe and today may be healthy. And also another communication is that visitors are already back enjoying tourism as much as they did before the incident to show them Tell the rest of the world that, that we, we already have the tourists back here and they are really enjoying this uh, destination. And we'll share what the actual visitors feel about the effectiveness destinations after incident to the potential visitors with concerns to this. There are lots of lots of people who tend to think that, oh, can I go there? Can I go to Jamaica after the incident? and show them that already people here, we have visitors enjoying themselves. And that really relieved the, for potential, uh, the, the concerns of the potential visitors. And lastly, priority segments are repeat visitors and fans of the affected destinations because they are the quickest to return. They are more likely to come back to support the recovery of the destination they, that, that they love. Next, please. Oh, maybe this is the end of, oh, yep. And in a tourism recovery market, marketing, first target the market in segment that are more likely to visit the affected destinations. And once the visitors back begin to return, gradually expand the marketing activity to other, the rest of the world, other markets. So I, today, I, uh, first, uh, I, I kind of concentrated on the, the crisis, uh, the resilience and crisis management of the tourism businesses. And maybe uh, my colleagues, uh, two other colleagues on the panel will uh, make a, some uh, remarks on the, the res resilience and uh, crisis management as a destination. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, thank you very much for that interesting perspective and that integrative approach to understanding um, these issues from a practical standpoint, uh, specifically as it relates to issues of ensuring that there is business continuity. To be quite frank, uh, many of the critical issues that you spoke to are issues that we ourselves at the Global Tourism Residence and Crisis Management Center have encountered. And I'll just quickly repeat them so the audience can recognize the, the essential terms. And this is planning, partnerships and networking, research, monitoring, communicating, and capacity building. And, and these are the key takeaways for me. Um, in terms of looking at how we integrate the tool towards achieving sustainable development. Um, our next presenter, Mr. Nakumaru, Nakamura, um, I've had the pleasure of meeting. Um, he is a Japan International Corporation, JICA, individual expert on comprehensive disaster risk reduction and management. And he's currently assigned to the Caribbean Disaster Emerg um, Emergency Management Agency, um, CEDEMA which is here in the Caribbean. Um, in the last decade, he has worked on a number of projects as an expert in this particular area in countries such as the Philippines and, and, and other parts of the Asia Pacific region. And since 2019, he has been operating in the capacity of an associate professor 
at the Advanced Disaster Prevention Engineering Research Center at Nago Nagoya. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Nagoya, um, at the Nago Nagoya Institute of Japan at, at the Nagoya City in Japan. Um, Mr. Nakamura, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable Ed uh, uh, Bartlett, Her Excellency Ambassador Richard, friends of GTRCMC, uh, headed by Professor Waller, distinguished panelists, Mr. Takamatsu and Mr. Isa, participants and the audience of the seminar. Good evening from Barbados, West Indies. Uh, my name is Hayato Nakamura. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Professor Waller. And as he mentioned, I'm working here uh, in Caribbean region, uh, Barbados, uh, as a disaster risk reduction DRR expert from JICA for CDMA, Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, which is a Caribbean community institute to cover DRR matters here in the Caribbean region. And uh, Jamaica is one of the very important particip uh, participating states for CDMA system. While Mr. Takamatsu discussed uh, tourism crisis management based on his experience and the knowledge with the, um, on the tourism sector and private sector, I will try to brainstorm about DR, disaster risk reduction and tourism based on uh, JICA's experience or my experience on DR in Japan and Asia in order to consider and the DRR for tourism in small island developing state, uh, states, uh, particularly the Caribbean region. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I believe that those of you in Japan already know about JICA, but JICA is um, implementing official development assistance, uh, ODA of Japan with the scheme of grant aid, yen loan, technical cooperation, and other various schemes, including the dispatch of experts, so that I'm the one of them. Under the JICA's vision, leading the world with, uh, uh, leading the world with trust. And trust derives from, of course, Japan's exper uh, economic and social development experiences, as well as, well as mutual understandings with our partner countries, such as Jamaica. And we have uh, implemented various projects from hard to soft. Uh, hard infrastructure uh, includes such as the underground railway in Istanbul in Turkey, the international terminal of Hanoi Noibai Airport in Vietnam, and the flight control facilities in Metro Manila, Philippines. Next slide. Uh, no, sorry, I'm um, not before that. Um, and while uh, we are covering the uh, 150 countries in the world, the Caribbean region, uh, JIC has offices in St. Lucia, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Belize, Haiti, and I missed here uh, on the slides, but we also have an office in Cuba, La Havana. Uh, we're waiting for the arrival of the tropical storm Yang at this moment. Uh, next, please. Uh, DR, disaster risk reduction, uh, is one of the important areas that we are working on the ODA works. As Japan itself implementing various disaster risk reduction works within our country historically. Japan has hosted all world conferences so far on DR namely Yokohama, Kobe, and Sendai. But the most important thing is that DRR, in the Japanese language, literally says prevention and mitigation, which is uh, pre-disaster action. So our works focus more on pre-disaster action while we try to uh, uh, comprehensively the DRR process as a whole. Next, please. Thinking about the nature of DR works, DR contributes to economic, de economic development by minimizing potential losses, as shown in the figure. 
so that uh, uh, for those who are working in the private sector, DR seems not so fun compared to the measures to expand the gains by marketing. But it is not the cost, but rather the investment in order to sustain the business. Uh, next, please. If I explain about DR cycle from the point of view from the public and the DR sector, there is a slight difference, um, but an important difference from what was explained by Mr. Takamatsu. Uh, crisis management in the private sector started with the crisis management plan, BCP, and awareness, as uh, stated so far. But the, uh, from the public sector point of view, it is very important to reduce the risk tangibly, so that making sure about the target risk, such as floods, landslides, and um, uh, through the uh, thorough risk assessment, and try, we try to mitigate or reduce the risk with various ways, such as flood control or other infrastructure. Then relevant readiness or preparedness response and the recovery action being implemented. When recovery, adding to the um, back to the normal, as um, what we, which was explained by Mr. Takamatsu, but we also echo build back better as Ambassador mentioned in the, uh, the opening statement, so that we do not have losses with similar hazards in the future. So that, that is the part probably the reputation management for the tourism sector, I believe. And please note that the flood control of Montego Bay, uh, which is one of the Jamaican tourism destinations, was implemented under Japan's ODA in 20 years ago. And I hope that it supports the tourism business in Jamaica at this moment. Next, please. Uh, disaster risk reduction is not only to do big projects like uh, flood control or the risk stoppage or construction whatsoever, but avoiding hazard risk is very important factor for the businesses. For instance, uh, the updated City Planning Act of Japan urges the relocation of the hotels from the disaster warning areas as shown in the slides. Of course, I understand that it's very, very hard decision on, uh, or hard measures uh, for each businesses, but it's very important that to uh, make tangible actions for disaster risk reduction. Next, please. And thinking about the tourism in the Caribbean region, uh, coastal hazards are one of the most uh, impacted matters. Uh, so coastal management is essential for the region. Uh, taking a nature-based solution such as mangrove planting or civil intervention, civil work intervention, at least like, it's important to seek better solutions based upon the local condition. Uh, next, please. Conservation of the destination should be not limited to the, the beach, but the cultural heritage is also important. The R of cultural heritage is not prioritized in terms of humanitarian relief alone, but it is critical for spiritual and of course, tourism recovery. And I understand that UNESCO is echoing the DR of cultural heritage in the international community. In Japan, based upon the um, fire case in the past, January 26th is set as the day of fire prevention of cultural heritage. Next, please. While well, Mr. Takamas touched on business continuity planning, but from the public sector point of view, safe and resilient infrastructure, such as logistic infrastructure, is crucial. And the resiliency of those infra facility, including operation and, ma operation and maintenance, 
should not be the comp uh, should not be compromised for the public investment. Uh, next, please. So, um, so far the discussion what I have made seems like uh, from the business uh, sector point of view, so that it feels a bit far. However, uh, I, I think um, um, we can make new value through DR and the tourism um, with the synergy effect. For example, in the recovery process, so that it's a build back better process in the top of the Tohoku region, uh, people found unique value in the locality through fishery and the agriculture products, which are utilized for tourism opportunities. Bes besides, uh, learning a learning tour on tsunamis with storytellers can uh, attract school trips and even the JICA-based uh, training as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, considering about uh, St. Vincent and the Great Grenadines of the Caribbean region, or some other volcanic uh, small uh, island states, which and um, uh, sometimes we're having uh, a volcanic eruption, uh, St. Vincent and Grenadines uh, the last year. So that I can highlight the example of the Toya Usu Geopark in Hokkaido, which erupted in the year of 2000. After the eruption, they conserved the remaining ruins, the damaged hospital and the housing units as the Echo Museum. Then in 2009, they registered the area as UNESCO Global Geopark. Along with such conservation, they fostered local specialists as Volcano Meister. Meister is a German word, so that it's like a specialist who can guide visitors and also implement DR education as well as crisis management during the emergency time so that they add the value of safety and safety and safe destiny, safer destination. Uh, next, please. In order to tackle emerging DR issues in the tourism sector, enhancing innovation uh, which was also already uh, explained um, by the minister. It's also quite important as a catalyst for making synergy effects between, two sec between the two sectors. Uh, this is the example of the preparedness of the shelter uh, in one of the labs of my university, Nagoya Institute of Technology, but it's done by other professor, uh, Professor Kitagawa. Uh, who is a, a designer, a architectural designer, has um, developed a methodology to build a durable house as an instant house, so that it takes only one hour to build a house. And uh, it was um, uh, considered to uh, uh, do uh, making a shelter, arrange the shelter during the emergency time. But it can, be uh, it can be used as a glamping or COVID-19 physical distancing booth or advertisement materials. So that, that's one of the innovations at the moment. Uh, next, please. Lastly, I would like to emphasize the importance of a regional coalition. Tohoku examples shows that while the tsunami affected area was quite limited in the region. The tourism recovery or tourism promo promotion was implemented under the name of Tohoku region. And I myself joined uh, one of the events and I could find the various unique feature features during the marathon. Sorry that I didn't put the, the uh, scenery of the water station or food station because I'm, I was running but the, uh, the food that I put there at the goal point and uh, they serve uh, sake and Japanese rice wine or um, and various foods as well. But not only there, but uh, in the water station, instead of water station, so that they provide the food for various re uh, areas anyway. 
uh, the next slide and the last slide. As a summary, as a part of the brainstorm is the uh, and DRR and tourism, so that I mentioned the investment. Investing DRR prior, prior to the disaster event is very important. Uh, even taking a longer, a bit longer term, but it is very crucial to invest tangibly. Then DR plus tourism make new value. Lastly, I have emphasized, emphasized the importance of the regional coalition or cooperation in the process of the gaining resiliency. I'm, I am looking forward to discussing uh, DRO for tourism resiliency further in the panel. Thank you very much for your kind attention and over to you, Chair. Thank you very much, sir, um, for that very solutions-based presentation, specifically focusing on the dynamics that businesses, um, tourism businesses in small island developing states, particularly those in the Caribbean, and you are very clear that you are familiar with the challenges in the Caribbean that they face. Um, many of these countries, as you know, are tourism dependent for their economic prosperity, but at the same time have to balance that prosperity with the immediate, with their immediate and their global environment. And, and it was very interesting that you highlighted and, and drew attention to the importance of investments as a mechanism to try to see how best to raise the necessary resources to be able to and, 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 and focus specifically on the issues of trying to ensure that balance. So, so thanks. It was, it was quite a very um, thought-provoking and interesting presentation. And I'm looking forward myself to some of the questions that um, may arise from the presentation. Um, our next speaker, um, is uh, Mr. Isar, Rajiv Isar, who is a policy specialist in the in disaster risk reduction and recovery for resilience building. And his other areas of expertise covers um, disaster and climate risk governance, urban risk management and resilience, uh, local and community risk management, mainstreaming risk and development. Um, Rajiv has around 20 years of experience of working on disaster and climate risk related issues at various levels, global, regional, national, local. And he has worked with institutions such as the Rockefeller Foundation and the Executive Office for the United Nations Secretary General. He currently works at the United Nations Development Program where he leads the thematic practice on urban and community resilience within UNDP Global Disaster Risk Reduction Team. Mr. Isar, your presentation is now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, Honorable Minister, Mr. Bartlett, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Richards, esteemed fellow panelists, and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for this opportunity to join you today to deliberate upon an issue connected to building the resilience of a key sector of our socioeconomic life, and which for many you know, countries uh, constitutes their economic mainstay, or even as a major you know, contributor to their GDP. My distinguished pan uh, panelists have already articulated many important perspectives, and uh, I would like to carry forward the you know, conversation by focusing a bit more on the changing risk landscapes, uh, the imperatives of building the resilience in, you know, in this context, and how risk resilience work has a close interface you know, with sustainable development, especially in the tourism sector. And some actionable ideas you know, that we can take forward from this uh, you know, discussion today to be further uh, explored and elaborated upon as we move towards on this journey towards making our tourism sector more resilient towards different shocks and uh, stresses over a period of time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my previous speakers and the opening remarks have also you know, articulated a number of challenges that, um, that we are you know, facing say, today. In a bit of a snapshot, if we look at IPCC's assessment report six, it clearly tells us that city economics and their socioeconomic resilience is likely to come under severe strain 
due to disaster and climate risks. And these are further you know, compounded by the typical geography of the sites, the narrow economic base and the high exposure, which makes them 35% more vulnerable as you know, compared to other countries. If we look at the past history, on an average, one disaster event causes a loss of nearly 14% of the GDP of an impacted island state and, it, and affects nearly 11% of its population directly. So not you know, taking into account the indirectly impacted, but just the, the directly uh, impacted segment of the, their population. It is estimated that the cost of climate change in the Caribbean itself is likely to be $10.7 billion by 2025 and $21.9 billion by 2050, which is nearly five as of uh, you know, 2025, or 10.3% you know, of the collective GDP of the entire region. So that's the kind of challenge that we are you know, contending with. You know, of the total disaster-related support to the SIP during 1999 to 2010, it, it is worth noting that only 10% has gone towards prevention and preparedness. But at the same time, you know, this, this vulnerability to, to disaster climate risks, in fact, goes much beyond that. It covers number of socioeconomic sectors, environment, livelihoods, inclusion, and number of other aspects of their day-to-day -day lives and livelihoods too. Next, please. So, so what is the existing and the emerging risk landscape that we are dealing you know, with and how is this important risk development nexus that we need to you know, take into account? We are already you know, witnessing that the, there is a shifting risk attributes today. There are no longer standalone or linear. It is more multidimensional, more intersecting you know, kind of risks which have systemic you know, cascading impacts across number of uh, you know, sectors and State stakeholders. We are, you know, traditionally oriented towards looking at risks to development. So there is a development infrastructure, you know, there is a housing or you know, something else that is uh, exposed to or, you know, say vulnerable to one or the other hazard. And we try to uh, mitigate it, to build our, you know, the capacities to prepare, to respond, etc. But at the same time, you now we need to also look at the the risks emanating from development. Because if we look at our you know, different socioeconomic sectors today, the, the development choices and the, the decisions that we make today are the ones you know, which are generating newer sort of risks or are trying to reshape and exacerbate the existing you know, ones. So our risk management uh, approaches need to take into account not just the risks too, but also the risks from development. If we look at our recent experiences, then we see that the scenario today is that there are shared risks and shared, you know, these vulnerabilities. There is a similar set of risk drivers, you know, which are underlying all the risk typologies. So whether we talk of, you know, hazard exposures, you know, climate at risk, conflict, fragility, or some of the other, you know, socioeconomic challenges as exemplified by the pandemic. So all this tells us that we need to better understand and, and assess the existing patterns of our exposure and vulnerability. There are certain pre-existing conditions that are common to these multiple typologies of risk, and we need to assess and understand them better to be able to devise appropriate strategies to address them. Next, please. So there has been a bit of a discussion on what constitutes a resilience. There is a UN Chief Executive Board, and there is, uh, you know, understanding of resilience, you know, which has been defined as, you know, sort of an ability. So there's an emphasis on the ability, you know, part of that ability of individuals, sectors, you know, communities, societies, nations, etc., to prevent, resist, absorb, adapt, respond, and recover. So positively, efficiently, and effectively without compromising long-term sustainable development objectives. So that, you know, there is a process and there is a journey towards a resilience and it has an end, uh, you know, objective, which should lead to a sustainable development, uh, you know, realization. There are certain elements, you know, which have been identified, so better understanding the, the risk 
context that was you know what i was talking about in the previous uh, slide the system interconnections how is one you know system or a sector you know next to the other and what are these linkages you know which tend to exacerbate the impacts over uh, you know a period of time what are those sectors and stakeholders that need to be brought into this conversation and what are the kind of the capacities needed to build a resilience so the capacities identified for building the resilience are preventer anticipator absorber adapter and transformator and all of these need to be backed up by some sort of resources and it's not just you know financial it can be technical it can be knowledge it can be you know research it can be the ability to cope to respond and bounce back so all these elements you know together and these you near know, capacity together build the ability of a system of an individual of a sector a community or a nation to uh, move forward on a sort of a resilience pathway this approach has been outlined in the in the uh, un common guidance on helping build resilient uh, societies much more details and and examples where this approach is applicable to different challenges different sort of a risk uh, context uh, etc next slide please drawing inspiration there you know, from our drr and the recovery you know practice has five thematic areas that we try to focus on and you know contribute towards building the resilience one is the actionable risk information so that was the first thing what are those uh, you know analysis of data so what are the risk you know context damage and loss accounting system the sendai framework monitoring how are we moving towards that so what kind of risk information can be shared you know, with different sectors and stakeholders so that they can imbibe them and integrate into their development planning etc second is the disaster and climate risk governance so when we are speaking about governance of a risk so it's not just the elements that's the laws the policies the strategies etc that we definitely develop but also at the same time how are these you know different elements operationalized how is there a some sort of a coordination between different sectors and you know stakeholders and how is this uh, informing and influencing a development decision making so that's important that that information needs to be you know translated into a well informed development decisions third is the early warning systems and the uh, you know preparedness many of us are familiar and i will not explain these uh, you know much more fourth is the resilient recovery the ability to bounce back uh, assess the kind of damages and those losses that have been uh, uh, inflicted by a particular risk or a, a sort of a disaster event and what best can be done to to recover there from not just build back better but build back forward you know looking towards the, the emerging challenges also and the last bit is the urban and the local action that you know speaks about the bottom up sort of a resilience building approach where we engage the communities the urban and the local authorities to you know contribute towards a resilience building uh, efforts next slide in form there by and looking at these risk and uh, the resilience nexus you know with the development a risk informed development approach has been developed which again you know speaks for a five pronged approach uh, towards that and the first you know part is supporting the evidence base why should a sector a government a private entity or some other individual also invest in a risk reduction measure so there has to be an empirical evidence what is that cost benefit analysis you know that goes into it so that sort of an uh, you know assessment and analysis need to be made available uh, to different sectors and stakeholders be it individuals also so that they make well informed choices and decisions you know when it comes to either their livelihoods or the development decisions that they make on a day to day basis second is supporting risk informed policy now uh, there has to be a sort of a policy linkage or a policy coherence that we speak about none of our sectors are stand alone you know, whether we talk of a drm you know policy or a tourism development you know, policy it has to be connected to number of other you know sectors and those policies so those policies have to have that inter phase there has to be an objective you know which is common across these different policies so supporting that is another you know element of this approach 
third is supporting risk informed implementation how are we able to do some of the program development planning development programs to implement that what are the kind of uh, you know capacities that are needed for implementation what is the kind of the responsibilities and sort of coordination that is needed to ensure that there is effective implementation of a decision that has been made fourth is fostering sustainable finance so there is very important that this has to be based on you know what we say a public expenditure a review what is the risk informed integrated national financing framework sort of like economic modeling that can be done to inform that what are the kind of resources needed to move towards this risk informed development here you know, to get to what are the um, you know, how are we able to mobilize these resources and it is just not you know, external assistance it can also be you know augmenting the, the domestic revenue streams at the same time and lastly is to ensure that this risk informed development approach is people centered and stakeholder driven it's not just that, that some administrative entity takes a decision about that but at the end it has to be localized it, it has to be institutionalized at the local level to ensure that that nobody is left behind on this journey so in a sense that this reduction needs to become a normal part of development and, and economic activity more integrated into it and mutually a reinforcing sort of approaches as opposed to stand alone risk reduction you know work that we uh, normally might be attuned towards doing next slide please so specifically coming to the tourism sector many of us have already spoken about it but we just to recap a bit more that tourism has been among the most affected sectors of economy worldwide during covid-19 uh speaking at a global level there has been about a, a 44% decline in tourist arrivals in since in 2020 and this was much higher in the caribbean uh going up to 67% in 2021 the sits suffered an estimated 70% decline in the travel related revenues you know which generated as the, the tourist inflows declined between 60 to 80 you know Supercells. This has high socio-economic implications beyond the tourism sector too, as nearly more than half of the work, you know, for the employed in this you know, sector is women. So there is a household impact, and there is a family impact that we definitely need to take into account. And this decline in the revenues and the development investment is also, uh, you know, leading to lesser, uh, you know, investments in a resilience. you know building if we do not have those revenues available then you will not be able to have the, the resources to to invest into that and this is the uh, more important because now we know that risks are you know having a long impact and a slower sort of a recovery you know process there are numerous examples you know covid has told us the ongoing you know climate emergency and many of the, the prolonged you know crises in terms of you know conflict war etc that we Uh, see around us, and all of these you know, compel us to have a relook at these risk attributes and how they they tend to play, you know, play with each other. Next, please. Now, taking into account Ambassador Richard's uh, exhortation in the beginning that we need to have, you know, some sort of an action-oriented dialogue, there are, you know, certain ideas that we might uh, take into account or analyze or uh, and explore more if we are to move towards building the resilience of the tourism. Uh, the sector needs to place a resilience and sustainability at the heart of the business strategy. It should not just be, uh, you know, uh, giving a tourist, uh, you know, product. It is more about how are we able to ensure these, uh, uh, you know, qualities at the same time. Integrated risk analysis and resilience diagnostics. We need to re-evaluate the risk context, maybe using DRR or you know, climate change as the entry points. simply because there is more data there is more evidence available as the drr you know practice has over the past decades been able to build number of uh, disaster damage and loss data fields etc you know, et which help us to understand the effects of of these risks on tourism assets and the vice versa so so what we were speaking about in terms of the risks to and risks from development so it's not just the impacts on you know tourism assets 
but at the same time, how tourism assets you know, tend to exacerbate some of these challenges that we you know, face. We also need to reorient investments in TRR and sort of a resilience building. As I mentioned in the previous uh, in a slide, that over a decade or and more from 1999 to 2010, only 10% of the assistance spent towards prevention. So we need to increase that, and it should not just be a response in a centric uh, assistance from either the international community or uh, you know, the outside uh, development partners. We need to have more fairness, such as capacity. This has already been emphasized by my fellow panelists, and it's likely based on the experience during the COVID pandemic itself that the next generation of tourists might be more demanding in terms of you know, what are the safety protocols there. Because, you know, COVID-19 was not just a health emergency, it had various other impacts. So tomorrow's tourists, they might demand whether the, the services or the, the, the tourism providers, uh, are they able to give me a different sort of, a, you know, safety feel? Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, when we speak about tourism, it's an experience. So what is the experience that's being offered to a visitor and, you know, what is impelling him or her to spend more time in a tourist destination as opposed to, you know, to the others. So keeping these demands in mind, there is uh, definitely a need to invest more into building the capacities of our tourism professionals itself who are into this industry to integrate all resilience dimensions. We normally you know, tend to focus a bit more on the physical or the built environment and tend to ignore the social economic, the environmental and the governance aspects. But if we are speaking in terms of building the resilience, then I think all these four you know, dimensions need to come together. We also need to reconfigure the ODA paradigm. You know, currently, it is pegged to the income levels of the countries, but I think there is a time now to move towards a multi-dimensional sort of a vulnerability index. More you know, vulnerable a sector or a country or a community is, the more you know, support or, or assistance you know, should be extended was that and not just based on the income levels of those countries. Next slide, please. We need to do development differently. So as I already uh, you know, mentioned, our development choices are today reshaping some of these challenges and these disasters that we are kind of witnessing. So we need to move towards a, a risk-informed development, diversification of our you know, social economic assets, of building more towards a knowledge economy. Our planning and the budgeting also needs to factor in the upstream, downstream, and intersectoral linkages. So how can say we have a tourism policy which does not take into account the water management or you know, governance or the or the energy or food security? Or how can we have a food you know, security policy which does not connect to tourism or you know say water? So all these inter linkages across you know, sectoral, you know, what we are talking about in terms of a policy coherence also need to be factored into. Reorient the tourism offer. Honorable Minister you know, was talking about the theme of rethink tourism. I think that's you know, where this point clearly sets in. We need to look beyond the traditional notions towards and move more towards a risk-aware nature and climate-friendly, equitable tourist you know, destination. Are we oriented more towards a mass, low-end you know, tourism products or was lighter, high end you know, touristic experience. So, from an infrastructure center towards a more nature and people centered you know, tourism might be an approach that we need to look at. More improved policy and you know, planning connect. So, risk informed tourism infrastructure, which also needs to be complemented by holistic tourism development plan. So, the balance uh, you know, between sort of coastal experience or, you know, sun and sand, you know, sort of experience that are normally advertised vis-a-vis -vis the carrying capacity of that particular you know, coastline. Just mass tourism vis-a-vis -vis sustainable. So some of these choices that we have to make and move, you know, forward towards that. Lastly, we have to make a resilience building and risk reduction everybody's business. We need to take the risk and a risk management out of the administrative domains. It's normally, you know, our you know, thinking is that this is something you know for the government entities you know, to do. 
we need to move out of that, engage the private sector, the technical academic institutions, communities to work more on you know, climate change and get our work. There has been a detailed uh, work done on the resilience building in the tourism sector in this newsletter. The link is here uh, in this. And with that, I would like to end my presentation and look forward to an interactive uh, you know, discussion. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Isar, for foregrounding the risk moment in disaster risk reduction, which is a variable which, to be quite frank, I don't think has been thoroughly ventilated, not only with regard to issues of disaster risk reduction or sustainable development or climate change, but certainly in tourism resilience, which is a, an emerging um element of an emerging moment of the tourism space. Um, what, I, what I personally took from your presentation was the, the importance of the interconnectedness of risk, understanding the interconnectedness of risk, understanding stakeholders and their capacities, um, the importance of governance um, in connection to this um, disaster risk reduction, looking at issues of controls and coordinations and the different elements that impact on decision making, but more importantly, um, data analytics as an element of informed decision making in supporting policies. Um, um, to be quite frank, and thank you for your presentation, excellent. Um, all three presentations in my esteem are, are all moments that are synergetic and could I could possibly even go further and say that based on the presentations that they all converge. Um, and at that point of conversion, you know, we recognize that the solutions, you know, are emerging and I have them here as capacity building, investing in the future, partnerships and linkages, monitoring, raising awareness, um, a data-driven approach and recognizing the importance of governance. And, 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 I, and, I, and that's my personal takeaway from all of the different presentations that we had here today. Uh, we're finally at that moment that we're taking some questions and um, I don't know if we can take all the questions that I'm seeing coming in thus far. And I'm gonna pose the first, and these certainly these questions are for anyone to answer. Um, first one is what are the ways we can account for uncertainties in the disaster risk management process, especially in the tourism space? I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know if Minister Bartlett also wants to be um, to respond to some of these questions. Um, based on his experience, but um, that's the first question that um, that was thrown out. So I don't know, it's open, the floor is open, anybody who wants to answer the question may go ahead and repeat it again. What are the ways that we can account for uncertainties in the risk management process, particularly in the tourism space? And the person in bracket, they had put uncertainties or outliers. Do we have anybody? Um, is there? Do you have a taker? Anyone? Anyone is um, responding to that particular question? Go ahead. The floor is open, gentlemen. I think perhaps I should I should make an attempt at this because we have had to manage uncertainties in our own navigation of this pandemic so far, and the issue of uncertainty is by its own definition uh, leading you to iterations. It's a, how do you do it? Um, what is the basis on which you can make uh, informed uh, responses? Uh, what level of innovation is required in, in doing that? Um, so we initially looked at the science, what the science said. Uh, we, we're, we're guided by that. Then we are guided by what data said. And then what we do is to look at what the cultural and um, sociological uh, space offers by way of traditional responses because almost everything that happens to you has a little bit of history that is tied somewhere there. Um, it is often said there's nothing new under the sun. What happens is how do you deal with those elements that happen to you? So I think um, managing uncertainty is pulling then on science. It's looking at data and, and what it offers and then the tradition and, and, and practices over time, and um, of course, innovation. So when you have information and data, how do you convert that to respond to 
the uh, immediate practices, the immediate issues as they come before it. I think that um, that's, that's as best as we could. In, in the process of doing that in Jamaica, we were able to establish protocols in relation to how to manage these things. Then out of that innovation, we brought in a resilient corridor, uh, a geographical area that we define to enable best practices to be applied in that space. The result of which was we had, in the case of the pandemic, an infection level that was 0.01% which was significantly lower than the average within the communities. I think that perhaps that might offer some guidance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Bartlett. Um, 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 Mr. Isar, I think this one is for you. Um, could, you kind of, could you kindly expand on your idea of switching to MDVI to guide ODA as opposed to the current practice of pegging eligibility for funding on a country's level of income. What would that MDVI look like from this perspective? Thank you so much, Shar. And I would also like to add on to you know, what the Honorable Minister said in response to the previous uh, you know, question too. When we do a risk analytics and a resilience diagnostics, we normally take into account you know, sort of known risks there will definitely be, you know, unknown sort of risks, you know, which might emerge uh, as we move ahead. And unknown or uncertainties, you know, might also be not just how the, the risks emerge, but how they, uh, you know, sort of uh, play out in terms of their impacts, in terms, in terms of their, uh, you know, sort of a cascading nature. So our analysis of known risks and our investments in uh, mitigating them, our investments in building the capacities to, to prepare, to respond, to recover, also enable us to meet some of the unknown, uh, you know, ones which might arise. You know, taking a, a military advantage uh, here and trying to apply it because it's an equally a major challenge, uh, you know, for us as uh, you know, communities, there is an advantage used in the army trainings the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. So if we do a sort of a more, uh, you know, futuristic thinking, a scenario, you know, planning exercises, you know, with the risk management and trying to see like how uh, tomorrow's risk might unfold. You know, what will I do if a scenario happens and uh, you know, what will I do if scenario B, you know, takes place? So that enables us to, uh, have the confidence or some sort of an ability to meet some of the unknown, uh, you know, ones. That's one. Second, our, uh, you know, focus also needs to move towards uh, towards reducing the exposure as much as, uh, you know, we possibly can. And another, uh, you know, point important, you know, which I uh, mentioned in my uh, talk also was about looking at the shared vulnerabilities so when we are looking at that, many of those are, you know, common across different risks and might also be the ones, you know, which will be underlying the, the future unknown, uh, you know, one. So that's another, you know, way to address those uncertainties. And thirdly, you know, there is a phrase in the, you know, telecom industry having some sort of a redundant bandwidth. So we also need to have that redundancy or that bandwidth to be able to manage and, you know, cope you know, with some of those uncertainties. Uh, and thank you for this, uh, you know, question on the MDVI. It has been a recent discussion, you know, which has been happening at the international level, because uh, today, if we are talking in terms of exposure and, the, you know, vulnerabilities, there are many developed, you know, countries, high income, you know, countries, you know, which are equally or more, you know, vulnerable than the other, uh, you know, ones. Our international development assistance is today back to the income level of the countries. So LDCs or low income countries, low and middle income, you know, countries, while vulnerabilities and our, uh, you know, susceptibility to various challenges, to disasters is not connected to the income level of a particular country or a community. There might be uh, really develop, developing or middle income or middle and high income, you know, countries, communities, you know, which might be equally you know, susceptible. And many of the states are in that category itself. So should we continue to peg this uh, international assistance to the income level or move more towards 
what is the kind of challenge that particular country and a community is faced and higher the challenge or higher the vulnerability, the more the need to uh, you know, extend uh, the international support and assistance to that to manage it and mitigate it. So we're looking at why does it say multi-dimensional? Multi-dimensional in the sense because this, you know, again, if we look at the resilience attributes, environmental, you know, social economic poverty, marginalized position, inequities, you know, discrimination. So these are the, the factors which add to the vulnerability. So we need to take into account many of these, you know, vulnerabilities and do the the assessment. So and and uh, you know, attempt towards developing this sort of an index has been made. Some uh, you know, analysis and, and assessment is being done to further inform this uh, you know, debate. It is still a discussion. It is not a decision. But we definitely, knowing the challenges that we are uh, you know, contending with today, there might be a need to move towards this also or to take it into you know, consideration at a higher policy level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do, thank you very much, sir. We have one more question. Um, hold on. It's a very long question, so I'll try to see if I can summarize. It says here, for many countries, the tourism industry is a major economic driver. In the last decade, we have witnessed many disasters increasingly threatening popular touristic destinations. It is critical for the tourism sector to invest in preparedness and in disaster resilience. But do tourist interests demonstrate, so do tourist interests demonstrate any interest in investing in DRR? Are there any best practices and what are the main challenges in faced face with trying to get them to be interested in investing in DRR? Very long question, but I think it, it basically tries to ask um, to what extent are there best practices in tourist destinations, businesses, so to speak, investing in DRR and if so, um, and if so, what are these best practices, and what are the challenges um, surrounding getting persons, um, businesses to invest in in DRR? I think I think that's the, the basis of the question. It's it's an open question for um, anyone who wants to ask and um, respond. I think you're muted. Um, okay, go ahead. Yes. Okay, this is Masato Takamatsu. L let me uh, add a few things about uh, your question. Um, well, uh, for, for for the the visitors and uh, tourist market, uh, it's not easy to identify whether the, the destination, particular destination, is has largely invested in DRR. But uh, there are a lot of things that they can really. Uh, see and feel confident about the safety of the destination. By, for example, um, the earning uh, early warning alert when uh, there is the uh, you know uh, the major disaster expected shortly in a multi uh, multi languages. You know, um, as I said uh, in my presentation. Uh, the visitors who are experiencing uh, disaster are at a loss what to do because of the lack of the information they can understand in their own languages. So this is one of the things. It's a very, very small investment or development, but still has a large impact on the building confidence to to the the visitors and also the the signage in the the public space uh, where they show the evacuation uh, you know shelter direction for the evacuation or even uh, in destination like uh, on a coastal uh, resort um, the the signage to show the elevation for the civil means a lot. Because when there is a tsunami alarm, they know how how high they are from the death sea level, so that they uh, they can understand what uh, you know where they they can uh, they should uh, you know evacuate to the higher place, or they can they are still saved if the the elevation is like twenty five meters from the sea level, something like that. So likewise, 
um, for the entire community, maybe the, uh, the, the investment on the resilience or the DRR is a huge amount of money. But in, in the tourism sector, there are lots of lots of things that can be done in a very small amount of money, uh, efforts that still can uh, uh, give the confidence to the people who are visiting there. And then that's, um, I think, the, the characteristic of the tourism sector and, and uh, our businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, sir. I, I want to add something, ahead, please, if I may. Okay. Um, from the point of view that the question, I think, is born out of experience, that there isn't enough being done. And that's true. So this process of reimagining tourism, as we are trying to do now, should inform a new perspective on building the RR. Um, and the public sector and private sector have to work together on this. In the case of my own experience in Jamaica, we have established a policy in relation to destination assurance. And that whole policy takes into account all of these critical elements that are now have to come together to create the synergies that enable safety, security, and seamlessness in the destination. And I think that um, it's, a, it's a whole new ball game that is emerging. Um, I think that the private sector is realizing that a critical part of their profit motive has to be uh, resilience building. And they're doing that now far more in terms of not just building and the quality and the integrity of construction and the type of designs, but they're also paying a greater attention to environmental um, you know, ecosystems and social ecosystems. So there is a greater involvement in the communities that are around, um, the social uh, responsibility framework is strengthening. So I, I, I hear the question very well. I, I feel the pain of it because I know that it is true that enough attention has not been paid to it. But what we want to do in this whole new process of reimagining as we recover, let's try to recover properly, better and stronger. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Bartlett. We have time for one more question. Um, trying to choose which one of the questions to ask. Uh, what are some of the ways we can ensure that the interests of, vul of vulnerable stakeholders are included in risk planning processes? So let me go again. What are some of the ways that we can ensure that the interests of vulnerable stakeholders are included in risk planning processes? This is a question of um, governance and exclusion and inclusion. Can I can I uh, make a, some of the comments or sure. answers? Go ahead. No, I'm simply just. I mean, the uh, question so far is uh, interrelated in some extent. I was thinking like it's more like the governance, risk monitoring or risk planning governance is very very important. So the, uh, it sh I mean, uh, so the vulnerable people should be included in, in the process of the monitoring. So the, that uh, also ensures the matters for uh, account the, for uncertainty, of course, because uh, it's not certain. That's why so that we try to monitor the situation or whatever. So that uh, for any matters, so the, uh, it's very, very important the, uh, to see the governance because uh, uh, risk reduction or resiliency matters, of course, the tourism, but in general for the DRR. Uh, we cover many sectors, so that uh, even the UNDR discussions, the breaking silos is uh, one of the key for the uh, arrangement. So the uh, inclusion of the vulnerable people, so that will be the matter for the silos. So the tourism, social uh, sectors or whatever, so that everywhere uh, in any government or any even the regional or international uh, organizations, so that there is some kind of silence. And uh, when we have a, a discussion on DR, even the last original platform of the DR uh, uh, hosted by Jamaican government, so the, the breaking silence was uh, one of the key 
elements. And um, at least like, uh, inclusion of the uh, vulnerable peoples for the risk monitoring benefit a lot for tourism, of course, because uh, we can ensure that, that any person can travel anytime for any matters. So that uh, I think uh, those for the governance, uh, uh, focus on the governance is one of the key for the uh, for the way to go forward. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Takum Takumatsu. Um, I think we are now at the the end of the program. Uh, we do have some more questions that were thrown out, but we promise to collate these questions and um, share them with the presenters and the other persons who are part of the, the presentation team and try to see how best we can summarize the responses and post them on our social media pages and our website so we can keep the conversation going because it is a very critical and germane issue to the tourism space. It's, it's very critical. And that last two, those last two questions in particular, and you're right, Mr. Takamatsu, that it spoke to issues of governance, primarily um, issues of inclusion and exclusion. And, and, and of course, for those of us who work in the development space, we recognize the, the, that this does happen, but we also acknowledge that it is a very disastrous thing because it means that persons are excluded from the decision-making process and decisions that are made may not be made in their interests. And, and we do know the dangers of such a paradigm, especially in dealing with such a critical development issue. Um, thank you everyone for the time, both online and in person that you took to participate in our event today. Uh, it, was, it, was some, it, was a, it was it was actually a topic that I myself knew some, had some knowledge of, but did not understand the gravity of the critical issues that have emerged in this discussion, um, some of which have definitely contributed to my, um, I mean, me, uh, myself, I need to think about um, the tourism and the tourism space, especially as it relates to issues of business continuity. And as we leave here today, permit me to use this opportunity to thank um, all of the persons who have been working behind. And I said earlier, I thanked um, Ambassador and her team in Japan and, and here in Jamaica, we have a, a number of persons, uh, Mr. Preston and his team, and, and in particular, Anna, our Director for Global Affairs, who has essentially been the rock and the driving force behind the Jamaica aspect of it. And of course, one can only imagine that um, having an event of this nature you know, starting seven o'clock p.m. in Jamaica time and nine o'clock in 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 um in 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 in, in Asia time, and I think perhaps ten o'clock for you, Mr. Isar, or a little later for you, Mr. Isar. Um, but it does five a.m. five a.m. So so I <laughs> I had to bring up this to the presenters because I'd also love to like to thank the presenters. It was a because uh, it has a it has an arduous task synchronizing all of these timelines together and getting persons to be up and speaking very coherently about this subject matter. So thanks everyone for your contribution, and we look forward to seeing you in Jamaica on the seventeenth of February at our international conference on tourism residence and sustainable development, at which we will launch Tourism Residence Day. Uh, thank you everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And good night from Kingston, Jamaica. Thanks to you also. All right.